This video is supported by Curiosity Stream. With more and more human explorations to outer space, a new problem has emerged, the space debris problem. Numerous, hard to track and dangerous are the essential reasons why space debris is a threat to both the safety of our astronauts and the safety of our assets in space. But what most people don't know is that we do have a structured solution for all of this. It involves what I call a three-step process, prevention by design, capture, and finally removal. So without any delay, let's talk about it today. Over the past decades, space debris problem has become a headache to space operators. Depending on the size of the debris, at any point in time, there are over 17,000 baseball-sized space junk floating around in space. Floating is probably not the right word to use because every one of them is traveling at over 20 times the speed of a bullet. Estimated by the European Space Agency, there are over 29,000 objects with a size greater than 10 centimeters flying around in space. 750,000 objects between 1 to 10 centimeters and over 166 million objects that have a size between 1 millimeter and 1 centimeter. As infinite as our universe, the Earth immediate space is quite a crowded zone. Not only that, it's also a dangerous zone because the speed of those debris, as I mentioned, it's at least 20 times the speed of a bullet. Therefore, even the smallest debris could cause a disaster in space. To add on to this, Kessler syndrome also dictates that the danger of space debris could be accelerated by collisions among them which will cause a chain reaction that results in a totally uninhabited Earth orbit. It will become a death trap for future missions if we don't stop it. In the same paper, Dr. Kessler further concludes, The processes which will produce these fragments are totally analogous to the processes that probably occurred in the formation of the asteroid belt but require a much shorter time. Dr. Kessler calls this a debris belt, and if it became a reality in the future, no space missions would be possible. This is how dangerous space debris is. Lucky for us, after he explained the danger of space debris in the 1970s, NASA took it seriously and started researching on how to remove space debris. Good call NASA, good call. That's part of the reason why most satellites now have a deorbit instrument that pushes the satellite back to Earth when it's no longer in service. Launch providers also actively deorbit its abandoned stages to fall back to Earth so they won't contribute to space debris. But before I explain further, you might be wondering, why is this video titled NASA Space Debris Problem? Doesn't space belong to all of us? How is this a NASA problem? Here's the thing. As much as we romanticize space exploration, countries are not created equal in terms of our space resources. The United States has a much larger stake in space than any other countries in the world. For example, NASA paid for half of the $100 billion International Space Station, a portion that's larger than all the other countries combined. Most satellite producers, rocket launch providers, as well as launch support facilities are based in the United States. In terms of the satellite business, over 60% of satellites in space are either serviced by American companies or are direct assets of the American government or American-based privately owned enterprises. So it is not at all a stretch of imagination to claim that the space debris is an American problem because America has benefited most from the space. From a capitalistic point of view, Americans own more properties in space than any other countries in the world by a large margin. Obviously, NASA knows about this. It started researching on space debris removal since the 1970s, and lucky for NASA, it is not easy for a piece of space debris to stay in space forever especially for lower Earth orbit missions. In fact, most objects that has ever reached space came back due to gravity. In order to truly stay in space forever and escape the Earth's gravitational influence, an object need to achieve escape velocity which is 11 kilometers per second, so it would be too hard for us to accelerate space debris to that velocity. But lucky for us, space debris do not need to achieve that velocity to be harmless. This gets us to our first way to mitigate space debris prevention by design. Specified by the United States Government Orbital Debris Mitigation Standard and Practices, a used satellite is required to do one of the following three things if possible. Atmospheric re-entry, maneuvering to a storage orbit, or direct retrieval. Storage orbits are commonly referred to as graveyard orbits because all used satellites and abandoned rocket stages go there. Four potential graveyard orbits are being used currently. Each is used for satellites sent to different orbits. 
low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, geostationary Earth orbit, and beyond. If you're interested in the details, check it out in the link down below. The first two methods are frequently done. SpaceX fans should be familiar with this because used Falcon Eye stages deorbit all the time, but if none of the prevention measures are made, direct retrieval is necessary. Many companies are working on it, and all of them involve a two-step process, capture and remove. In a paper published in 2016, Sean outlined the various methods of capturing and removing space debris. In terms of capturing debris, we can either use a contact method or a contactless method. And as you can see, they're self-explanatory, some captured by gnats, some captured by robotic arms, so I won't explain further. When it comes to removing debris, however, some methods do not even involve capturing at all. The laser system is a good example. It uses pulsed laser beam to shoot onto a space debris to decrease its altitude. Other contactless method includes artificial atmosphere influence and ion beam. Regardless, the general principle of all these methods is to decrease the velocity of space debris, thus lowering their altitude by ejecting some medium objects in their trajectory. Depending on the particular characteristics of the debris, different capturing and removal methods should be used. This is the harder part of solving the space debris problem. However, the good news is that just in the last few years, private startups and companies have entered this field, including SpaceX. The biggest challenge for them, in my opinion, is to make the removal method adaptable to different types of debris so that their services could be adopted by most companies in the world. But you know what? Adapting to the market is what startups are all about. If anyone in the world can solve the space debris problem, I would bet on private startups. Just like how startups solve the reusability problem in the launcher market. Lastly, all that we've been talking about limits to Earth orbit. If you're interested in the Moon, Mars, or beyond, check out CuriosityStream, our sponsor for today. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries, including exclusive originals from some of the world's best filmmakers. They have an entire section focused on space, so if you like this video, I'm sure you'll like their documentaries too. Videos like this one. So look at that. Wow, you can really see Mars in its full glory. This episode of Miniverse is also my recommendation for you today. A fantastic episode hosted by the sensational astronaut Chris Hatfield exploring our universe right here on Earth. My buddy at CuriosityStream also offered you guys an exclusive 31-day free trial. So if you want to support this channel, do sign up with a link in the description down below with the code CuriousElephant. Once your free trial is up, they only charge $19.99 a year, which is $1.67 a month. So start binge watching and exploring our universe today with CuriosityStream.